Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the webinar today. Uh, today's topic is evaluating the capabilities of behind the meter solar and storage for providing backup power during long duration power interruptions. Uh, the webinar today is being presented by Clean Energy Group, and we're excited to have some great speakers with us today, authors of the report from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, I'm Seth Mullendor. I'm going to be your uh, host and uh, moderating the, the Q&A today. Before we kick in and I introduce folks to our presenters, I'd like to do a little housekeeping. Uh, all of our attendees are in listen-only mode. You have two options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. Uh, you can call in via telephone or connect via your computer's mic and speakers. Uh, if you'd like to minimize the webinar viewing panel, you can do so by clicking this orange arrow uh, that you see circled here. Uh, you can also click the orange arrow to expand your webinar console. Uh, one thing you might like to do during the webinar is submit questions and comments. Uh, we'll be saving some time at the end of the webinar presentation to answer those questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, I encourage folks to enter those as you think of them. Don't wait to the end to make sure that you have a, a better chance of getting your, your question answered and during that time. Uh, last thing, and we get a lot of questions about this, uh, the webinar is being recorded. Slides and a recording for today's webinar will be sent to you via email, usually within the next 48 hours. Uh, you can also find all of these materials posted on our website at cleanegroup.org slash webinars. And we have a lot of upcoming and, and tons of past webinars, past webinars that are, are archived there. So with that, I am going to introduce our speakers for today. Oh, actually, sorry. I am going to introduce you to Clean Energy Group. For folks that are not familiar with Clean Energy Group, we are a national a nonprofit advocacy organization. And we work at the forefront of clean energy innovation to accelerate an equitable and inclusive transition to a resilient, sustainable, clean energy future. Uh, we do a lot of work in a lot of areas. This webinar is uh, most, most closely related to our Resilient Power Project, which uh, looks to expand access to solar and battery storage for energy resilience, for backup power, specifically for underserved communities, low-income communities, communities of color and uh, medically vulnerable, climate vulnerable communities. To learn more about that work and our other projects, you can go to our website listed here, cleanegroup.org. We have all the webinars I mentioned, publications, reports, blogs, and, and lots of other information. So with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, first up, we have Galen Barbos. He is a research scientist in the electricity markets and Policy Department at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. His work over the past 20 years has focused on issues in the electricity industry related to renewable energy, energy efficiency, and electric system planning. His research on distributed energy resources includes efforts to track and analyze system cost and pricing trends to evaluate policies and programs that advance equity and access in solar markets, and to evaluate the impacts of changes to utility rate structures and regulatory policy. We also have J.P. Carvalho. Uh, he is a principal scientific engineering associate in the electricity markets and policy department at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. His research areas at uh, Berkeley Lab focus on long-term power system planning, integration and planning of distributed energy resources and electric vehicles, and reliability and resource valuation. JP holds a PhD and MS degrees in energy and resources from the University of California, Berkeley, as well as PE and BS degrees in electronics engineering from Universidad Tecnica Federico Santa Maria, Chile. So with that, I will turn things over to Galen. Great, thanks Seth, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, and thanks to all of you out there who have, who have joined the webinar. We're really excited to be able to share this work with all of you. Uh, so JP and I are gonna do a, a little bit of a tag teaming here. Uh, I will start out 
Uh, and before I begin, let me just give a few introductory comments on, on the research that we're going to be presenting. So that the work that we'll be sharing here today is based on a report that we issued a couple weeks ago uh, by the same name as, as the title of the presentation here. Uh, we've also included the URL where you can find the report on the title page. Um, and probably there's a link to that in the um, announcement for this webinar as well. So hopefully between <laughs> those three methods you can find the report if you're interested in it but if not certainly feel free to to send either jp or i an email um so this work is uh kind of the the first in what uh, will be a series of studies that we'll be conducting over the next few years evaluating different aspects of uh, behind the meter solar and storage in backup power applications this particular study, as the title indicates, is focused on looking at um, their ability to provide backup power during long duration power interruptions. And, and by long duration, uh, for the purpose of this report, we're really thinking about uh, interruptions lasting uh, at least 24 hours, if not more. Uh, so with that, uh, let's proceed to the next slide. Um, going all right so just very quickly in terms of the organization of, of the presentation so i'm going to give a little bit of, of kind of background and context on on the topic um i'll turn things over to jp who will take us through um, much of the remainder of the presentation uh, i'll just mention here a, one um sort of key element to the structure of the the analysis so you can see here that we have one part of the the uh, research that we produce the synthetic event analysis, uh, another part that is called the historic event analysis. Those are kind of the two main kind of results sections here. Um, most of what we'll be focusing on is the first of those two, the synthetic analysis that just involves uh, basically kind of stipulating power interruptions of varying durations uh, in each county of the U.S. And we kind of do this national analysis to look at how these systems would perform uh, across the, the country as a whole uh, and perform a whole variety of different parameter suites that we'll be sharing with you. Uh, the historical event analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit, involves looking at some actual historical long duration power interruptions and basically asking the questions, how would solar and storage systems have performed in providing backup power during those events based on the particular location and, and, and weather conditions um, at the time. Uh, so with that, let's continue on. Uh, so uh, just in terms of the, the kind of the context for this work, um, the adoption of paired behind the meter solar and storage systems uh, has been growing fairly rapidly, albeit from a small base uh, over the past few years. The, the chart here shows the percentage of uh, residential and non-residential PV systems each year that are paired with storage. And so you can see that, for example, about 10% of residential systems and 5% of non-residential systems that were installed last year uh, included storage, just to give you kind of a, a sense of, of the scale of this market as it exists today. Uh, that growth is being driven by a number of different factors, um, but one of the key drivers has been growing concerns around grid reliability and, and customer interests in providing backup power, um, given kind of the, the growing concerns around hurricane, wildfire, other kind of climate related uh, disruptions to, to power reliability. Uh, there have been a number of studies out there that have looked at how solar and storage systems can provide backup power. These have mostly been kind of case study type analyses. There hasn't been much um, up to this point focused on that, that really kind of tries to understand how these systems would perform across a broad range of different conditions and contexts. And so that's really the gap that, that our research is intending to fill. Next slide. Uh, so very briefly, uh, the, this work that we'll be describing here evaluates the capabilities of behind the meter solar and storage in providing backup power to the individual site hosts. Um, so we're not looking at microgrid type applications, but we're really looking at, at um, backup power provided to the individual site host uh, over long duration power interruptions. And our goal is to 
establish some sort of baseline set of performance estimates and expectations and to better understand what are some of the key performance drivers in terms of how well these systems actually function in, in providing backup power. Uh, this is a, a simulation based analysis, so we're not you know, looking at actual data on deployed systems. It's all based on kind of modeling the performance of these systems using uh, modeled solar and load uh, data and then simulating how battery storage would be dispatched during power interruption events. Uh, one of the unique elements of, of this analysis is the load data that we're using, that the, the simulated load data um, is disaggregated to the end use level, which allows us to look at backup performance, not just at the whole building level, but also for, for designated critical loads. Um, and we'll say more later about how we define those, those critical loads. Uh, also, in terms of the study scope, we look at both uh, a variety of residential and commercial building types. Uh, for In the interest of time, we're going to focus today mostly on single-family residential, um, though we do have a few results uh, to share on some of the other building types. Um, and really, the, the main kind of thrust of this work is to then look at how backup performance varies across a broad range of different climate building stock and outage conditions um, and so you'll see a lot of kind of scenario analysis that explores how performance varies along those dimensions um, in looking at uh, performance variation across the, the building stock our focus is really on understanding the differences across the existing building stock um, we're planning over the next year to take a bit more of a forward-looking uh, view and to assess how backup performance might um, might vary as buildings evolve into becoming much more efficient and flexible and, and electrified. Um, we, we touch on some of that within this year's study, but that's a, an aspect that we're planning to explore um, much more thoroughly in the coming year. Um, also, in the coming year, we'll be extending this work to look at backup performance also during short duration uh, outages, which are, of course, much more frequent than the long duration outages that we're looking at um, in, in the current study. Um, and in and exploring those short duration outages, one of the key elements will be to understand some of the interactions with other things that customers are doing with their batteries, whether that's arbitrage and TOU rates or managing solar cell consumption, whatever it is that those kind of day-to-day -day uses of the battery then can impact the ability uh, to provide backup power. And that's something that we'll be looking at over the coming year. Uh, so with that, I think uh, the next slide um, will transition over to JP. Thanks, Galen. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. I'm going to uh, provide an, a brief overview of the uh, data and methods utilized in this research, uh, and then I'm going to uh, start exploring some of the results. So for uh, analytically, our uh, work relies on three main input data sources uh, or input data uh, components, power interruptions, end use load profiles, and solar profiles. Uh, as Galen indicated, all of these are uh, simulated. Um, in particular, the power interruptions, uh, the thrust of our analysis is based on these synthetic events, which are really um, uh, simulated interruptions that last between one and 10 days, um, with, with, uh, spread in every, every, with one day spread in between. And we use this as a parametric suite to um, identify the performance uh, of the uh, PV and storage systems between this um, in this duration, which encompasses the vast majority of uh, long duration events that occur historically uh, in the continental US. Um, in addition, as Galen indicated, we do have a bit of empirical analysis uh, using historical long duration events, which uh, of which we select 10 of them uh, that encompass encompassing four specific counties for each event. And in those, we do uh, reflect the empirical time, start time and duration of this particular events. And we also um, align with the, with the weather patterns that existed in that. And the idea is that in these historical events that are, are largely weather-driven weather or extreme weather events, 
the performance of PV is uh, largely impacted by the particular weather conditions. And so it's different than in the synthetic events where we do have, um, we're not making particular assumptions about the status of the PV performance. Although we do uh, do some uh, sensitivity analysis that get at uh, trying to capture some of those um, variations that you will see later. The end use load profiles are um, built on simulated hourly load profiles from NREL's Restock and Comstock models. These are fairly detailed models that simulate uh, thousands of buildings in each county uh, using uh, a very sophisticated stochastic approach. And that yields uh, essentially uh, data sets of buildings across for each county in the US. And so we're using a, a, a identifying a typical building uh, that we use for each one of our analysis. It's three residential and three commercial building types. Um, and then in the residential single family, we explore within the whole um, uh, space of building profiles, the, the specific performance across that, that space. And finally, for solar profiles, we simulate them uses and roles a system advisor model. I mean, um, yeah. Then the three inputs go into our storage dispatch model. This is a relatively simplified model that has no look ahead. It's just um, design, is storage is designed to meet specified critical load, essentially maximizing the ability of the system to meet load during an interruption. Uh, the storage is considered to be fully dedicated for backup, backup capabilities, as Galen indicated. We are not exploring how storage could be used for other purposes and hence having a state of charge on a given mo moment that is not 100%. So in all our simulations, the storage is fully charged right when the interruption hits. And we have a number of assumptions and scenarios in terms of the storage and PV sizing, uh, the critical load composition, uh, when the, uh, the, the interruption starts and how much it lasts, and then the state of charge. I'm going to cover some of those and how they impact results. And finally, the key output metric that we we'll focus on is a percent of critical load or total load that is served during interruption. There are, of course, a number of other metrics that could be gathered. In particular, all this analysis we're going to present has no cost component, so there are no economic metrics. Um, this is just technical, uh, technical performance. In terms of critical load, uh, we leverage, um, as Galen indicated, the capacity in, in particular in rest stock of having load split up by end uses. And that allows us to cluster some of these end uses in three different backup configurations. Uh, so the limited critical loads are what we considered and based on some literature review, the very basic um, end uses that consumers want to keep on during longer uh, duration interruptions. Since these are refrigeration, lining during the evening hours, uh, pump for well water in, in the places where this is needed, and basic plug loads that include computer, internet, and cell charging. You know, I, I, we set it at a certain a 70 watt sort of average power level. Um, on top of that, in some in most of our scenarios, you will see that we wait and we analyze critical loads, and this include the limited critical loads with uh, space conditioning. So uh, heating and cooling related end uses, uh, depending on uh, whether it applies. And most of our analysis focus on the critical loads. And then w there is, of course, analysis on the whole buildings. We do present a couple of results, but we understand that from a resilience perspective, a whole building backup performance is not as relevant. I will say that, unfortunately, on the commercial side of things, uh, the, 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 the Comstock model does not have such a good uh, definition or uh, um, um, Disaggregation of end uses, so we were not able to do this particular analysis. So I'll present it in the context of residential end uses. In terms of sizing, of course, sizing um, of PV and storage does have a uh, an impact on results. So we created a base, sort of a baseline case, and then a few sensitivities around this. The base case for single family and mobile homes in the PV side of things is assuming that the PV size to generate about 100% of the annual energy consumption. And we run a sensitivity where we assume a PV system that achieves half of that, so it's essentially roughly half the size, and, and another sensitivity where we subject the PV to some roof area constraints. Uh, so having said this, the, the PV sizing, um, the PV systems that result that meet 100% of annual energy consumption are well within the typical values that we see uh, in most empirical assessments of existing PV sizes for residential contexts. On the storage side of things, uh, we did a relatively simple approach where we chose two specific values, 10 kilowatt hours, which is roughly the, the, the size of, a, of your typical um, 
uh, storage system in residential uh, contexts, and then 30 kilowatt hours, which is a little bit on the uh, upper end of this um, of this range. And in some cases, we run sensitivities up to 100 kilowatt hours that represent a potential EV battery that is doing V2G and, and, and supplying a home in the case of a long duration interruption. But most of our analysis hinges on the 10 kilowatt hour and 30 kilowatt hour sizes. I'm gonna turn it on now to the synthetic event analysis. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a sweep of uh, interruptions that occur uh, that, that last anywhere between one to 10 days. Typically, most of our results are focused on a three-day interruption with turn out to be a good, a good middle point between interruptions that are relatively common, but also not particularly short or long. So uh, you, will, you will see that most of, re most of the results I'm going to share um, are based on this three-day interruption. Um, we're, most of the results, again, are focused on um, county median homes, so the median home in a given county, uh, and, and then later on we'll do a little bit of a analysis on the, on the whole building stock. So this is a first set of results. What you're seeing here to the left is a, a map for each county in the U.S. We have about 3,000 counties uh, trade in this in this map and it's split in seasons and in this case we're showing the two uh, PV size configuration at 100 percent and 50 percent annual load and I'll just point out that the, the season difference is uh, early on showed to be important to be uh, identified because not only because of the PV production that of course is different across uh, seasons but also because uh, certain end uses will prove to be critical in terms of how they impact performance. And we will be exploring this in a little bit more detail. Now, in this base set of results with 10 kilowatt hours of storage and just the limited critical loads, this is with no space conditioning, we see that largely those uh, PVN storage system can supply most of that limited critical load across the country for three-day duration outages. Um, even in systems that are, paired, are brought down to a 50%, this remains true with some mild exceptions um, that still serve a very high level of load. And when we move now to the same backup performance analysis, but including now in the, on top of the limited critical loads, the uh, heating and cooling loads, and then the whole home backup, things uh, change quite significantly. And so the backup performance uh, across all counties and months, it's still about 85% of this critical load. This is, again, limited critical load plus space conditioning. And of course, this, not, this number, as a caveat right away, will be higher if we assume that the users adapt their temperature set points, you know, increasing the temperature set point in the summer or decreasing it in winter. We do a little bit of that in a few slides. You'll see that we analyze the sensitivity to this. So this is of some sort of a conservative analysis. Uh, we start immediately identifying these results that the performance is lowest in winter months in regions where electric heating is common, for example, in the Southeast and the Northwest. And it's also performance is lowest in the summer months in regions with large cooling loads, like the Southwest and the Southeast. And no surprisingly, of course, the backup performance is uh, relatively low for a whole, whole home backup. But as I mentioned, this is uh, not a at the most prominent resilience application. So we're going to be focusing mostly on the critical load sets as we uh, move on with our analysis. We we're interested first in understanding how do the results would change with a 30 kilowatt hour battery. So in the top end of the, um, the typical sizes that you see in the market today. And in this case, we see a relatively large jump in terms of the, aver the average uh, uh, capability of performance jumping up to uh, 96% of, of critical load serve across counties with a range between 75 and 100% in the 5th to 95th percent, um, uh, percentile values. Um, the, the spread in this, in this 95th and 5th percentile do reflect the sort of the same geographical patterns that we have observed before. In the little map, you see that the places that are not yellow, that are greenish, uh, that are achieving under 80% performance, tend to be those located in, this, in the southeast and the northwest, uh, given largely the presence of electric heating or some level of high cooling loads. And um, when we analyze this in a parameter sweep of battery sizes, we do see that, of course, as larger batteries, uh, large batteries allow for uh, larger portions of 
critical load being served, but there are in, indeed diminishing returns. So this gives you a sense that from an economic perspective, perspective, if we were to try to find a sweet spot, it will definitely not be on the very large size of battery. There's a point where the uh, the percent uh, percent load that you gain for each kilowatt hour of battery starts uh, becoming very, very small. And so um, there is a sense that there should be a sweet spot here uh, as we analyze in between the 10 and 30 kilowatt hour, which perhaps is not surprising that these are actually the ranges that you see in the market. And our study confirms that. Um, I'm going to continue moving on and focusing on the 30 kilowatt hour storage as we analyze um, other single family home sensitivities. In terms of outage duration, the results that I showed um, so far are focused on the three day interruption. We're interested in understanding how would this um, systems vary in terms of uh, longer duration. And what's interesting is that this doesn't move linearly as one could have expected. Um, as the duration starts increasing, uh, of course, backups starts declining for two main reasons. One is that initial store battery, the initial store energy in the battery is, is depleted and depending on particular conditions for PB production and net load or net or load in general, um, net, then the whole performance starts becoming limited by the daily PV generation and general and daily net load. And um, again, we're making no assumptions here about demand response. We're just trying to meet this critical set of loads. And of course, as the in the, the longer the duration is, it's more likely that we find ourselves uh, hitting a low solar or a high load day within, within the duration. And so that also decreases performance. Now, with all this, as I mentioned, the effects are quite modest. There, there, there's not a linear decrease in performance. It tends to stabilize at a certain level between around the 90% range for the average of counties. Of course, there are many counties that achieve 100% regardless of the length, and there are um, you know, many counties that are uh, well under 75% of um, average critical load surf. But it's still interesting that the, in general, the, uh, the trend is to stabilize uh, and as you balance the, the load levels with the PE production on each specific county. Um, an important um, realization that we had as we were making the simulations is that the choice of the start day for a long duration interruption matters within each month. And this is because um, in reality, an interruption can hit at any time. And it's, un it's not necessarily clear that when the interruption hits, it will be hitting a period of high load and maybe low PV production or of low load and, and high PV production. And of course, this will have an impact or may have an impact on backup performance. So what we did was to um, move from our ch original choice of a median net load day as the, in the, 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 the moment where the interruption begins to show sensitivities across two possible um, interruption start scenarios. A worst case scenario that um, involves starting the interruption being uh, hitting the consumer in the in the highest net load day, and then a best case scenario where the interruption hits in the lowest net load day. And the effect of these different uh, um, interruption start points uh, does depend on season and end uses. So across county meeting homes with the have electric heat, the average performance that drops significantly to 53% of meeting uh, the critical load. Uh, in the worst days compared to a 96% on the best days. So if, if you have electric heat in the winter, uh, depending on when the interruption hits, you have a much higher, almost double the chance of, of, of serving your critical load as opposed to if it hits in the worst case scenario. Um, this is a, um, relatively similar, but not as pronounced in the case of uh, homes with uh, air conditioning hot climates. So in this case, uh, the lower percentile uh, doesn't go as low. It, it stays, you know, close to the 85, 90% range, but there's still a reduction uh, in the in the case of summer cooling needs uh, between the worst and the best case scenarios. Um, to be sure, the effects shown here reflect intramonth variations within a typical meteorological year. So there are obviously gradient variations that occur occur with extreme weather and across many years of uh, historical solar radiation. And, and load behavior. And some of this will be captured in the historical events that Galen will explore later. I'm going to spend a little bit of time now on the analyzing how, uh, so far we have focused on median homes on a given county, but uh, of course, within each county, there is a wide variety of buildings and, and with building characteristics. And so the backup performance across these buildings uh, may differ within a county. 
So we chose specifically six geographically diverse counties to analyze how backup performance vary within uh, key building stock characteristics. So you're seeing here to the left our choice of um, six uh, uh, metro, metro areas or counties that, have, that are highly populated, Seattle, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, Phoenix, and Boston. And for each one of these charts, you're seeing the uh, distribution of critical load surge for each building uh, in within these counties. And we're talking about thousands of buildings on each county, so there's a fair amount of effort going in here. And you're seeing in blue the medium building that we have been exploring in the past uh, in the past slides. And what we see is that in out of the six populated counties, four of them show that the, the critical load serve is very, very high and the variation across the building so is very small. This may be a reflection that the choice of PV size and, and storage size in particular um, are maybe a little bit high in, or high enough compared to the characteristics of the building so such that the critical loads are met you know, across most of the buildings in that particular county. However, there are two counties, uh, Houston and Phoenix, where this is not the case. Um, the variations in building stock is such that we do indeed see um, a number of buildings that are well under the medium building um, and, and with critical loads that are served uh, even below uh, or even much, much lower than the median, uh, the median case. And so we're going to focus on these two specific counties um, in, in Harris County, Houston, and Maricopa County, and Phoenix uh, to understand what may be explaining this wide variation of performance. So the first analysis is to understand um, how does the uh, critical load uh, absolute value affects the uh, percent critical load serve the performance. And this is important because uh, with while the PV size does scale with load in general and critical load in particular, uh, that's not the case for storage. And so what we see in general, as we would expect, is that as critical loads increase, um, of course, performance tends to decrease following this S shaped. And this is largely because of uh, what we're uh, describing, that um, PV does scale, but uh, storage is fixed at 30 kilowatt hours in this scenario. And so as more, more load is present on a given uh, place, the ability of that particular storage unit to serve the load becomes lower. Um, the scatter around these trends reflect differences in customer load shapes, and daily variation in critical load amounts. And so while there is a band around these, uh, this black line that you see there that represents the median values, um, those, those is what, uh, what reflect in part the variation for a given critical load level on behavioral aspects um, driven by, by customer choices. Um, we believe that the differences in these critical load levels reflect a number of fundamental drivers, the square footage of the home, the heating and cooling equipment type, and especially uh, electric versus uh, fusil, uh, fossil fuel heating, the efficiency of the building envelope and end uses, and some occupant and behavioral factors. And so we have enough data in this uh, data set to, under, to uh, deep, delve a little bit deeper in the, in the last two of these, and we're going to show this in a couple slides. So on the first hand, we try to understand how does the backup performance uh, of these solar plus storage systems uh, with a 30 kilowatt hour uh, storage system and meeting critical loads that include space conditioning. How do these vary with uh, two measures of energy efficiency? Uh, infiltration, or how air leakage me measured in the H, air leakage rate, or the CFM50, and um, the uh, rating of the AC uh, efficiency uh, in the AC unit. And we do this again for Phoenix and Houston uh, with a focus on winter and summer, the way you see to the left. And, what we find is that performance is about 20% lower for leaky homes, and this effect would be even more pronounced for electrically uh, heated homes in cold climates. So in this case, we're mixing um, different types of, of heating, and so but we find that as the homes leak more, the backup performance of the system decreases. Um, in the bottom figure, we compare the backup performance in, in summer months based on the efficiency of the air conditioning measured by the CER uh, um, rating. And we find that backup performance is higher by between 10 and 20%, depending on um, the county, for homes with high efficiency air conditioning relative to homes with lower efficiency air conditioning. So these trends illustrate and give a, a sense of how uh, efficiency, both in the building stock and in the end uses, do have a fairly large potential to improve the performance 
of a PV plus storage system for backup purposes. Finally, on the other um, analysis that we um, intended to do relative to um, building stock characteristic and, and underlying drivers, we tried to understand how moving heating and cooling set points would affect the performance of the system. So as you may, um, uh, may infer, uh, as we move these set points, the, the total amount of critical load, of course, will change. And the higher set points in the in the summer will meet lower loads for the AC system, and inversely, lower set points in the winter will also mean lower loads, especially for electrical heating and heat pumps as as they as they exist. Um, what we find is that the heating set points um, are most relevant to electric heated homes, which are common in Houston and Phoenix. Um, the average set point that the heating set point that we have analyzed is uh, 70 degrees. And we see that um, in Phoenix, the vast majority of homes are fully served at that level. But in, in Houston, we need to decrease the set point to 60 degrees to also achieve a, a high 95% plus uh, load served for, for all the buildings in, in the stock. And of course, um, this is this is simple analysis where we're just varying the set points for all the homes. There are many homes that are still served with um, higher set points. And so there is in, indeed a small number of homes within these counties that would need to bring their set points down to achieve this higher uh, levels of load, uh, load serve. And of course, the outcomes will be very different for uh, electric heated homes in cold weather climates. And this, this you know, Houston and Phoenix are not particularly cold weather climates. Um, we just, again, chosen because of their particular high population and the distribution that exists within their building stock. Moving to the cooling set, set points is uh, relatively similar, less, although less pronounced that we have been seeing in general, AC is less sensitive compared to uh, the sensitivity of uh, electric heating. So across a range of set points shown between 65 and 80 degrees, uh, the, median summer, the median summer critical load serve rises by about 18% in Houston and 12% uh, percent, uh, in, in Phoenix uh, within this range. And so we find that at least in Houston, most homes would be fully served at 80%, uh, 80 degrees. Uh, in the case of Phoenix, the increase is small, uh, but still we have about 90% of homes that could be uh, could be served uh, with 80 degree settings. And I think I'm going to turn it now to Galen uh, to talk about the other building types that we analyze in this in this work. Great, thanks, JP. So yeah, I'm going to give a, a very abbreviated version of our results for some of these other building types um, before then also giving a very abbreviated version of our historical uh, event analysis. Um, so in addition to looking at single family detached homes, which JP just described, we also looked at backup performance for several other types of residential buildings, mobile homes and multifamily homes, as well as a number of different commercial building types. Um, I'm not going to present or share any results for mobile homes. I'll just note that they didn't look all that different from the results we saw for single family detached homes. Um, mobile homes have somewhat higher prevalence of electric space heating. And so that for that reason, in some regions, um, we saw somewhat lower performance levels, um, but overall they, they look pretty similar. Um, on the next slide, JP, um, we have some results for multifamily homes. Uh, I'm gonna kind of skip over some of the material here and I think I'll, I'll just draw your attention to the map on the lower right. Um, so this, this map shows, um, similar to some of the maps we looked at before, uh, how backup performance varies for, in this case, the median multifamily home in each of the, the regions shown here. Um, and there are a couple important differences that I'll just note relative to what we saw for single family homes. Um, one is that in northern latitudes, you can see that the performance is um, lower. Um, and the reason for that is that for multifamily homes, where you're looking at typically multi-story buildings um, with uh, you know, a large number of individual dwelling units, the, the roof area um, can be a binding constraint on the size of the PV system. And, and that can be particularly impactful during winter months where uh, your ability to provide backup power is limited by um, low solar insulation levels combined with relatively small PV systems 
uh, in those winter months. And so that's why we see kind of darker colors uh, on the top of the maps. Um, in contrast, in southern latitudes, where for single family homes, at least in um, some regions, we saw lower levels of, of performance because of high cooling loads, for multifamily buildings, we don't see that same trend nearly as starkly. And the reason is just that um, multifamily dwelling units have less, um, are, are lower, lower consumption. And so for a given battery system size, um, the, the cooling loads, even in regions with, with relatively high cooling loads, is, is less of a constraint um, or, or less of a factor in terms of um, the backup performance that we see. So those are the kind of the two key things that I wanted to stress on multifamily. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we'll look at some of the commercial sector results. Uh, there's a lot here. I think you can probably ignore most of what's here. And, and I really just want to stress one point here. So we looked at, at three different commercial building types, hospitals, retail, and schools. And across those three building types, really the most significant difference is that hospitals tend to be multi-story and retail and schools tend to be single story. And, for, and because of that, uh, this kind of is similar to what we just discussed with the multifamily housing. Um, the roof size is typically binding in terms of the PV capacity for hospitals, where it is, it's, it's less so for those other commercial building types. And because of that, we see much lower performance levels for, for hospitals than we do for, for retail and schools. And that's why the, the black dots, uh, at least for some of these scenarios, tend to be quite a bit lower than, than the other dots. Uh, so that's kind of really the main point I wanted to stress here. Um, on the next slide, we look at um, some geospatial trends for just for standalone retail buildings. So these are kind of big, big box store retail establishments. And um, here, I think you can just sort of focus on maybe say the, the, the right hand set of, of maps uh, where we show uh, average performance in, in winter and summer months for a given system size. And there are a couple things, a couple trends here that I'll, I'll just emphasize. Um, the first is that um, in general, you see uh, uh, slightly higher performance levels um, in the southern latitudes during winter months uh, or lower performance in northern latitudes. Um, and that is uh, really driven by lower solar insulation levels. Um, conversely, during summer months, you kind of see the opposite trend with slightly lower performance levels in the southern latitudes, and that's driven by higher cooling demand. Um, but the, the, I think the bigger point here is that we don't see nearly as stark uh, a set of geographical trends for commercial buildings as we do on the residential side. Really, the, the bigger trend here is in comparing the winter map and the summer map, where really pretty much across the board, uh, we see much higher performance levels in summer months, really regardless of what part of the country you're in for the most part. And that's just, again, driven by differences in solar insulation levels. So I think that the main takeaway is that for commercial buildings, um, solar insulation levels, which of course very seasonally are, are really a, a much bigger driver relative to some of the other factors uh, compared to what we see on the residential side. Uh, so next slide, I think we're going to transition now to very quickly talking about the historical event analysis. And I know we uh, want to save some time for uh, Q&A. So maybe, JP, if you could just advance to the box and whiskers plot. Um, so we looked at 10 different historical uh, long duration interruption events. Those are listed on the, the x-axis here. Um, and for each of those events, we model the performance of the solar plus storage system for um, uh, a sample of buildings uh, in, uh, in each, for each event. Um, and so that's what, what the box and whiskers plots here is they show the distribution um, in performance levels across all of the different modeled single family homes. So we're just focusing here on, on single family homes. And what you can see is that for four of these events, 
uh, this the solar plus storage system was able to entirely meet critical loads for the duration of the event for all of the modeled homes. Um, those are the four events that where the box and whiskers is collapsed into just a, a horizontal line at the top of the chart. Uh, in addition, there were, were three other events, uh, Isaiah's in, in yellow, and then the two winter storms on the right hand side where um, the majority of homes, so at least you know the, the median performance level um, was at 100%. So the majority of homes were able to fully meet critical load. Um, you can see though, uh, obviously, uh, some variation. Uh, I think there are two points maybe to make there. First, there are uh, five hurricane events here, which are grouped on the left-hand side of the chart. And you can see that across those hurricane events, overall performance levels can, can vary a lot. And what we found is that really the driving factor there is uh, with hurricane-induced outages, typically there's some initial period of time, number of days, say, where um, there can be a lot of dense cloud cover um, and therefore low solar insulation. And th so the performance of solar and storage systems and providing backup power is really driven by how long that initial period of dense cloud cover lasts. For Florence, which is the, the light blue where we see the, the lowest performance levels, really the, the driving factor there is that there were basically four days in a row with very low solar insulation. Um, in contrast, in Michael and, and Isaiah, um, and, and even to some extent at Hurricane Irma, um, those initial periods of low solar insulation were much lower. And so that's why we see higher performance levels for, for those hurricane events. Um, the other uh, thing I'd note here, looking at the two winter storm events on the right-hand side, um, although the majority of homes were able to fully meet uh, critical load, you can see these long lower tails, and those lower tails are uh, consist of homes with electric space heating. Um, and so this is just kind of goes back to a theme that, that JP had already hit on, which is um, particularly homes with electric resistance-based heating, it's just much harder to provide backup power uh, for given a, a particular uh, solar and storage system size. So I think with that, um, we can kind of wrap up here. I, we have a couple of takeaways, which are really just sort of a summary of some of the points we've already made. And I think we can bypass those, though they are there for your reference. Um, and if maybe, JP, you want to just go to the kind of the, the end slide, and we can leave that up for the Q&A. So I think Seth, if you are out there, hopefully you've got some questions queued up. Yep, great. Some questions that have, you know, we'll get to those now. Thanks so much. All that information. And I encourage folks to check out the report. There's, there's a wealth of uh, additional information there um, that uh, we just didn't have for today. So one question that came up, uh, we had a rather technical question talking about the battery uh, battery storage and, and whether or not the entire capacity of the battery, so 10 kilowatt hours or uh, 30 kilowatt hours were considered, um, there was a minimum state of charge that was considered. Oh gosh, good question. Um, I believe, and unfortunately, the person who actually turned the crank on a lot of this analysis, Will Gorman, is off wandering in Patagonia or Hawaii or somewhere right now. I'm not sure. Um, so he he's the person who would really know the answer. I don't know, JP, if you do, but I think that we did not impose any minimum state of charge, but maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, I think the the system is allowed to fully discharge as needed, and and then it has to wait until PV starts producing again to, to charge. So we, we made no assumptions for, since the system is fully devoted for backup power, the reason why you leave some critical level of charge is because you want to have some backup power capabilities when your uh, battery is not performing only in that role. 
But in this case, since they, we assume the only role is backup power, we depleted it entirely uh, for most of our analysis. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think back. as we know from some of the recent experiences in Puerto Rico, um, you actually don't want to do that <laughs> in real life because you need to maintain some amount of power to, um, to actually um, make sure that like the auxiliary equipment can continue running. But that was, that was a simplification we made among many others. Yeah, and thanks, Gail. And I, I was I was thinking of that as well. We saw in Puerto Rico that, that sometimes batteries to get the batteries going again, which is of course not what we want to see. Um, although I do think normally the capacity that, that commercial systems list is the usable capacity, um, but that the, you know you have to be careful about not not draining it too low. Um, a question came in uh, about uh, points and whether or not you assume the typical uh, or well pump with a, an initial high amperage draw or or something else. I, you know, I think this may go to something that I know came up in the analysis, which was thinking about those those high power draw applications when when certain. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So um, I don't know about well pump specifically. I think where this issue came up sort of most explicitly in some of our discussions was with electric resistance heating, which um, just really whenever it's operating has a very high power draw. And so we, because our analysis is based on hourly interval data, we're, we're somewhat constrained in our ability to really um, even observe those sort of instantaneous power draws. Um, and so the way that we dealt with that is basically by um, sort of shedding individual end uses in their entirety. Um, so because we have kind of flows for each end use disaggregated, we prioritize them. And um, if, in this case, say electric resistance heating um, couldn't be fully met within the hour, then we basically just shed it entirely. Um, so that doesn't, it, that was intended to partially kind of account for this issue with instantaneous power draw, but um, it was something that we, yeah, unfortunately, weren't really able to do uh, as as rigorously as we would like to. But I think that's something that we're hoping to spend some more time figuring out how to model and hopefully get our hands on some more granular data. Great. Apologies, I've got some connectivity issues here, which is why I don't have my video on. So if I disappear for a while. Um, uh, a question that came in about uh, electric heat, um, assuming that that is resistant heating, and, and they want to know if you analyzed, uh, looked at how air source geothermal heat pumps would would change the, the results or impact the results. Um, so we, um, I don't think we showed them here. We we did um, in. For particularly for those kind of six counties where we looked at the distribution and results across all individual homes, um, we did separate out those homes with heat pumps from those with um, electric resistance heating. Um, and you know what we found is that your backup performance was was generally um, was was better, and in some cases, depending on the climate, much better. For, for homes with heat pumps compared to those with electric resistance heating. Um, but because we were focused on really looking at um, the existing building stock, um, the kinds of heat pumps that we're looking at are, are based more on sort of what's most prevalent in the market today. Um, and so um, I, I don't know offhand, but um, my guess is that, you know, we probably weren't looking at a lot of kind of cold weather, high performance heat pumps. Um, I imagine that you know the models that are are captured within Redstock are are somewhat lower efficiency compared to kind of the the, the high end of the market. Yeah, I may quickly add. I'm just seeing here that the backup slide, uh, Galen, that you're referring to. Um, in general, I would say there's it's about a 10 to 20 percent improvement in backup performance transitioning from electric resistance heating to heat pumps 
uh, with the caveat that Galen has, has mentioned already, where it's fairly limited in, in repre representing. But what we have shows uh, roughly that's kind of the, the increase that you get in performance due to the um, higher efficiency of those systems. Great. Uh, there was another question in general. Um, the math included in, in critical loads. Seth, I, I heard critical loads at the end, but I missed everything before that. Oh, sorry, hopefully, is this, hopefully you're hearing me now. Um, yeah. There was just a question about the methodology, that, that the thought process that went into determining what would be included in, in, the, third, in the critical loads. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thought process, I think, was, I don't know if there was, if it was a particularly structured thought process. Um, you know, we had an advisory group, and Seth, as you know, you're a member of it. Um, and we did spend a little bit of time talking with the technical advisors about kind of what particular loads might make sense to include. There's also some empirical literature out there um, that our colleague, Sun He, who's all part of this project, has, has led and, and conducted as part of her PhD re uh, research that involved conducting surveys of customers um, to basically understand like what end uses would they want to back up. And so we used the results of that survey-based research to also inform some of our choices. Um, but it was, it was definitely part science, part art. And I think um, in the feedback that we've gotten on the work, I mean, I think people often, you know, have comments of like, well, why didn't you include this or that, you know, cooking or, um, you know, they're all, yeah, it, it's, it's obviously a personal choice to some matter what is critical or not. Yes. Um, you talked about different set points and, and varying temperature based off of, say, battery conditions or, or solar. Seth, I'm, we've, we've lost you again. I heard set points. I think we have an outage. I think we might have. Right, Galen and Seth, I'm going to give you access to the questions box, I think, so that you can um, scroll through. Hang on. Okay. Hi, guys. Can you hear me now? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, I can drop it for a minute. It's a little windy here. I think that's what's doing it. Uh, we are close to the end of time, but that is one of those. Seth, your audio is going in and out. Um, Galen and JP, you should be able to access the question box on your webinar console. So if you want to expand that, um, we have two or three more minutes you could get to any other questions that you think are particularly interesting. Okay, I think I've figured out how to do this. Um, of course, now it's a matter of choosing among all of the uh, questions here. Um, Sorry, there are some good ones in there. There's been a lot of people on the line. So thanks everybody yeah. for uh, tuning in. Um, so a couple, uh, here's here's an easy one. Is Hawaii included in your analysis? No, unfortunately not. Um, we relied on load uh, uh, profile data that came out, comes out of NREL's res stock and Comstock models. And those are just for the continental US. Um, what was the array tilt angles on these samples? Were they optimized for summer production or winter? Um, I, I believe we just assumed universally self-facing at latitude tilt. Um, is there any similar data for homes using natural gas heating so that most electric loads are from appliances, lighting, and essential devices, e.g. oxygen concentrators? Um, so to the first part of the question, is there any similar data for homes using natural gas heating? 
Um, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think a, a lot of, I mean, depending on the region, um, that's what we model is homes with gas or other fossil based heating. There still may be some electrical load associated with the furnace fan. Um, but um, outside of really the, the southeast and the northwest, pretty much all of the heating that we were looking at was fossil based. Um, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, well, we're at the top of the hour and I'm, I'm uh, somewhat inept at, at going through these questions. So maybe we should kind of uh, cut our losses here and wrap things up. Um, and sure. Sam, I don't know if you wanna kind of close things out. I'll just say, before you do, I'll just say kind of thanks to everybody for joining um, and for your questions and to feel free to reach out to us um, if you have other comments or questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Galen and JP um, and Seth too. Thank you for uh, for your wonderful presentation and for getting to so many questions. And we will have people reach out to you. We'll make sure we put a link to your study in our follow-up emails. And we'll also have a copy of all the slides and all those other materials here in the recording. So we'll get those out to people today or tomorrow. And um, we've got a lot of webinars coming up after this. So do check out our website, cleanygroup.org slash webinars. And um, lots of exciting content coming up. So thank you very much again, everyone, for being here. Thanks, especially Galen and JP. And we'll see you at the next one. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.